Hi everyone, I'm Ari, and today we're looking at analysis of Big D from Hunter the Parroting by Bruv Alpha Booster. This is a review specifically done by Cosmic Void with a Q, so this was heavily recommended by my Discord mod, Horrier, who's also the person who told me about Bruv Alpha Booster in the first place, and then I ignored for a year. I'm going to say it was a year because the actual amount was longer, but I'm not going to cop to that. So I'm going to do something different and actually listen to the good advice this time and see what is up with this, because apparently... Something is up with this. I haven't seen it yet. Maybe by the end we'll find out. Either way, I haven't seen anything for Hunter the Parenting in a while, and I am jonesing for more. This is a really good way to scratch that edge. So yeah, link below, video, hit it up. Let's get started. Okay, we're dropping right back into the Emperor then. Bruv what? Alpha Booster is the name of a content creator and a channel on video sharing website YouTube. So it's going to be a I'm specifying this so that it makes sense video? contextually when YouTube inevitably burns into flames when we're all forced to migrate to Vimeo or Dailymotion or Big Berry's beautiful buttocks for streaming the service or whatever. Which for anyone who hasn't seen TTS, the constant B alliterations might seem weird. For anyone who has, you realize it's a reference to best boy. And yes, you have to say it like that. And I just love that because oh, I miss if the Emperor had a text-to-speech device. I've heard rumors it might come back because there might be some kind of legal agreements. But also, one, they're just rumors. And two, I don't want to get my hope up. It would be just too much. Which it's is nice home to, to what ultimately to amounts to fan fiction for various media properties. The channel was most mm -hmm. well known for its work in the Warhammer 40,000 franchise with the series If the Emperor Had a Text-to-Speech Device, which served as both a comedic way to do in-universe lore exposition and as an esoteric parody of the Warhammer 40k setting. Which is weird because 40k actually had esoteric parodies of itself. Obi-Wan Sherlock Clouseau is an actual canon in-game character who exists in the actual lore of the setting from Rogue Trader. So probably redacted, but with how 40k works, every now and again that was redacted or unredacted, and they turn out just to be fan redactions that were actually real and not sometimes not. If that doesn't make any sense, that's probably about exactly the right place to be in to understand anything in 40k. Before becoming a detailed and multifaceted interconnected story with an oh, overarching I want to plot, this it centers series. around the eponymous Emperor of the Imperium of Man, and it does an lead interstellar into state the in the parts. universe in the 40th millennium and beyond, which is one of the most corrupt and despotic states in the entirety of fiction that goes against literally every single one of its founding principles, with not even. And the funniest part is they're still the good guys because everyone else is worse. It's not the good guys, it's the goodest guys. <sighs> in a veil of separation. <laughs> the series focuses on him attempting to fix the Imperium, as well as his quadrillion D strategies against the enemies of humanity and Poking his with amusing interactions with various allies, servants of the Imperium, awesome. and his custodies. sons. The foremost notable of which are as follows. Kitten, yes, that's what they call him, and yep. it's bloody hilarious, who is the Captain General of the Adeptus Custodies and the main person that the Emperor interacts with while acting as Best his caretaker. Character. His role is to mostly play the straight man to everyone else's insanity, and to do the majority of the law dumps. Do, I remember Magnus that. the Red, one of the Emperor's Primarch sons, who due to an incredibly convoluted I'm sorry I'm having so much nostalgia and just pleasant memory about the entire series now this is what got me into 40k so just having him talk about this and going into big D just you know what the rest of the video could be shit and I'm going to love it just because he's giving me this massive nostalgia boost I'd almost want to buy Magnus not, not to collect thousand suns but just to buy the model because of this show uh, I spent way too much money on Custodes because of this show. Oh, Followed a series of events, pre-existing prejudices between him and his brothers, and manipulation from others, turned traitor and joined the enemies of man in a civil war known as and the Horus Heresy. The Fuck Emperor gives him a second chance, and he is convinced to rejoin his cause. He's basically a nerd wizard who screws up everything yeah. he attempts to do. If he attempts to help the Imperium, he will hinder it, and if he attempts to harm the Imperium, he will save it. Rogel Dorn, he's done it too. one of the Emperor's Primarch sons, who was missing for... I'm not saying that this is also one of the things I had to buy, but there is always the temptation to paint it yellow and find an STL version of that head. And if I could ever find a good one that I could actually somehow get was already printed out. And if anyone happens to know an eBay listing where that exact head is already printed out because I don't have a 3D printer, that would actually be incredibly tempting. 10,000 years. A loyalist who remained with the Imperium <laughs> during the aforementioned Horus Heresy. I say his personality is akin to that of Cardboard, but that would be far too charitable to the Cardboard. Somehow, yeah. he's also one of the funniest characters. Father, are you familiar with the expression, 
You are what you eat. <laughs> oh, jeez. Yeah, the best way to describe Rogel Gadorn, wow, I can't speak today, Rogel Gadorn, there we go, is that he is the straight man to kitten straight man. Normally, it's you have the straight man and the funny man. There's different terms for it, and frankly, these are old ones as far as I know. But Kitten is the crazy one by comparison to Rogodorn, and that makes him also the crazier because he's taking the serious fellow to a way further extent, and it's hilarious. It's just the -the over-the-top, in-your-face, no sarcasm, no subtlety, bashing you with whatever he's talking about statements. Uh, It's so good because you're not expecting it, but then it hits you in the face. It's like, yeah, that makes sense, and it just is funny. It's a character type that I actually quite enjoy. The fuck? Seeing as you're behaving like an ever-growing pile of screaming, <laughs> psychic children. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> accurate. And boy, a, well, just Did some random boy that. they picked up. He's a Vox hailer who operates equipment for podcast audio logs, which are a thing. And he just sort of ends uh, up hanging yeah. around and being kind of adopted by the main cast. Yep. This boy, boy, is a wholesome boy who Rogue really shouldn't be anywhere him. near the madness he's subjected to. Awesome. The quality of this series really cannot be overstated. It is incredibly cleverly written, <sighs> well informed about the lore of the series, and characters feel in character despite very obviously not being in <sighs> character, if that makes any kind of sense. What I'm saying... Oh, I just... You know, when I first got this, I didn't understand what was going on here. I got it was the Primarchs, but I was kind of wondering why there's the two crossed out ones. And yeah, in hindsight... It's the two legions that were erased. Oh, man. I just... Little things like this. I should definitely go back and rewatch this. Sense. What I'm saying is that the writing is done in such a way that a character like Magnus, who has fully embraced the forces of chaos, can be talked down and brought back into the fold in a believable way, in spite of this being something he's incomprehensibly unlikely to actually do. Plot lines... I mean... It's unlikely he'd actually do it if well written, but I could easily see GW deciding to make a push for an uncorrupted Magnus model after they release all the Primarchs. And yes, I'm going to include Horus and the Emperor in that one. And then they try to do alternate versions because warp fuckery to sell more models. See, it's that last part that is convincing me because model sales. And let's let's be completely honest here. If you've given into the 40k bug, you're already considering it. As much as you're saying it's stupid, as much as you're saying, Arier, they would never do that. They know better. They would respect the lore. Just take a second to think that. Okay, I'm going to give you another second to stop laughing. They would definitely do it to sell models. They've done it to the Lion. They've done it to Rogaldorn. Well, not yet. Sorry, I have to remind myself these are not actually his models. That's said whenever I get his head, I will put it on one of them. I'm going to call it a Rogaldorn figure. They will do that eventually, like they did in 30k, because money. And I will give them money for it. Probably too much and regret it if I think about it too hard. It's a complex and intriguing, and it explains the various facets of the franchise incredibly well. It is also extraordinarily <sighs> funny, mocking some of the more niche bits of lore and knowledge, like the fact that the Adeptus Custodes in one version just sort of went about the Imperial Palace guarding their Emperor. Naked essentially naked yeah this isn't a joke and these i thought it was at first and, and i wish they had kept it that way side characters that would be but it's not absolutely jokes. amazing when as a model goes to be, it can make characters and figures like the laughing god who are just broadly regarded as a joke or as being the sort of thing that an edgy gothic emo would edge until all the edge has been sandpapered into a smooth perfect sphere of no one being able to take them even remotely seriously or be intimidated by in any capacity <laughs> yep <laughs> the dark elder <laughs> Or otherwise ignored in wider law into genuinely unsettling and intimidating monsters that will haunt your nightmares. <laughs> yeah, gonna sleep friggin' great tonight, thanks. Some of my favorite moments oh, from the yeah, series involve playing card games with actual gods, the Dungeons and Dragons specials, the Bro Trip side series, a Magnus. Still think Bro Trip had one of the absolute best intro episodes had some of the funniest jokes and they were still good after that but they were never completed for the same reason nothing else ever did but it was so freaking good <sighs> you see now i'm hitting the part where it's like i remember as good as this was it's also it's still dead at that moment of realization still hurts <sighs> it's been what almost two years and it still gets you and the Emperor constantly arguing, the Emperor's eloquent soliloquies of verbal destruction, the Battle of Cain's Gate and Requiem for Dominique, and... Oh. Kai, 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 K
It was such a good one. They had Takahata read for him too. Having a mental breakdown. Like a piece of shit. It's great. Oh, it it really accurately was. captures the grim darkness that originated with Warhammer 40k. But, but also, it also the humor that was lost. a strange sense of optimism to it as well. It's out here saying that yes, the Imperium of Man is a horrible state down to its very core on an almost fundamental level, but it can still change. It's an uphill battle in a galaxy that almost necessitates the sheer brutality that the Imperium exists within to a degree, but the goal is still to reach that ideal vision of what it was meant to be. There isn't an alternative. If humanity keeps going down the path it's on in TTS, it's doomed. It has to change. And for all the absolute misery that the Imperium exports on a microsecondly basis, there is still something worth saving in it. Because and I think that's one of the differences between Canon 40k, well, early on, uh, uh, actually up until 8th edition even, and TTS 40k. TTS is grim bright, where Canon 40k is sometimes grim dark. See, the bright doesn't really work. The way that scale works is grim dark is it's a dark setting where bad shit happens and it's grim because it's only going to get worse. So I guess it wouldn't be grim bright. It would be hopeful dark. Yeah, basically the alternative is to this one is shit's bad, but it can get better. Although there's also the argument that you could say the current 40k and 8th, 9th, and 10th edition with the Primarchs returning everything hyping up could be said to always be getting better but also kind of doesn't it 40k canon storytelling doesn't focus on characters nearly as much as small side stories and sometimes they lead into bigger things but it just it's hard to say overall it always feels like nothing is moving and then everything is moving all at once when a primark returns who's only Gillum and I think about because all the others returning haven't had an effect yet. Technically, all the others returning would literally just be the demons who were then immediately not made relevant and well, demon primarchs and the lion whose story I don't really know much about. I know he's old. I mean, the model looks amazing. I still need to pick up a copy if they ever have it in stock again. That earlier moment I mentioned selling models and then just having <laughs> sweaty nerds buy them. Yeah, I'm not projecting at all on that one. Because as the Emperor puts it, there still exists that immense potential within mankind. Text-to-speech is what really got me into the Warhammer 40k yep. universe. I would and not have got in otherwise. I still re-watch with regularity. Save the Sometimes I'll even watch reaction videos to it, just so I can get a taste for the hey! feelings I got when I first saw those episodes. Also, holy shit, is that what my camera looked like? Oh, it's like, on the one hand, I like the lighting better. On the other hand... Oh, wow. I still have that robe. That apartment I was in previously was really cold. I had a heater running and I still needed to wear this robe. I was freezing in there. Turning the PC on full blast, which is, if you don't have a PC, you know what I mean? But if you do, you know what it means to say that was the only way I heated parts of that building. Oh God, and by building it, probably just the apartment itself, but details. Ugh. First saw those episodes. I think beard envy of myself. But alas, text -to speech was not to last. In 2021, Games Workshop, the intellectual property owners of the Warhammer 40k franchise, okay, here comes the changed pain. their policies around fan-made content. For a long time, the company Sardis. was mostly fine with the existence of fan-made. Yeah, because they figured they can make money on it. They failed to make money on it, but then they took any money they can get, and it's good enough. Mm. Good people working for it. Bad people running it really great modelers yeah. so if he's bringing up 40k right now now that i'm taking the nostalgia glasses off a bit he's probably going to mention how if big d is basically a spiritual successor how hunter the parenting is the spiritual successor to tts it's a lot of tropes a lot of character beats a lot of interactions and understandings of how people relate to each other brought forward into a completely different setting that they have an actual license because there's a free one through white wolf to use in that setting for world of darkness old world of darkness i think yeah uh, which is something i wish 40k had so they could not be complete assholes and shoot their community in the dick about it hate content and animation in particular this policy however went against that sentiment and wanted an outright ban on the creation of fan-made animations this because was described money. as a zero tolerance policy this was being done at the same time as the release of Warhammer Plus. 
Yeah, funny how that worked out and that he stopped caring about enforcing those rules as soon as they went to a different model and this became less of their immediate focus. People are trying to animate for 40K again in the year plus since this came out. Not as much, but it happens now. You can find a few more coming out. And no one I've heard about has had any more legal issues with 40K because of that. But also, while they still have a lot of this stuff going on, it's not the immediate focus it feels like from previous events. I think they've more or less figured out, okay, the pandemic bump we were trying to take advantage of, we missed, and it's over. They're probably still going to push it. I wouldn't be surprised if more legal issues come up in the future. But it does feel like what they're talking about here, the Warhammer Plus move to our app and get all our digital content, fell through hard. They're still painting content on it that's valuable, and some of the apps are, I've been told, now really good. But also, this was not a fair price. This for a year would have been a fair price. Hello, actually, it would have been completely reasonable, and I would have championed paying them that much money to get all the content they had for five pounds a year. Not a month. Fuck no. And I realize I'm American. When it's five pounds, it's probably like seven or eight dollars in freedom money. So, yeah. Service you would have to pay money for, which these free, openly available fan animations would compete against. And were sometimes better would and had more of them. Done in an attempt to cripple what was seen and came out faster. Market. I am sorry. I am just absolutely living at the moment. But be that the case or not, Alpha Buser and the team of people whom he brought onto the project by this point made the choice to cancel text to speech rather than wait for a cease and desist to be sent that way. And outside. Actually, I remember seeing this specific note Brew Alpha Busa put out. It wasn't just that they were trying to avoid legal issues, it's that he had just become a father. He had people working for him who had actual need of financial income. There was a lot riding on this, and while they could have pushed on, they could have risked it. That would have been a legitimate, actual problem to his ability to be said father. Destroyed a lot of work they put in. So it was more than just, hey, my channel is destroyed. It would be, hey, my actual livelihood is destroyed and the people who rely on me would be destroyed. That is not just pressure. That is, oh, I can't justify this in any way, shape or form pressure. And he made the right choice to move on. Frankly, it worked out pretty well. Hunter the Parenting is great. And I will admit I'm a little biased because of the spiritual successor nature of the entire work itself. Also that Brew Alpha Boost and his team did it because they're freaking amazing and funny. Out of the release of the first two parts of what would have ended up being a three-part episode and the promise that if the policy were reversed and a new concrete one and its protections of fan-made content was put <sighs> into place, that it may one day return, this was the end of text-to-speech. See that part right there, the promise that it could return? That's... Games Workshop has reverse policies before. They've corrected things. They've also refucked them up after they've corrected them plenty of times. And while I might not be the newest player, I only started doing this in the before times. And for anyone who didn't immediately think the number 2020, there's probably very few people about that. But I've heard and heard horror stories specifically about how 40K used to be so much worse in its community representation than just what they're doing here. So this is still an upside. It's just sliding back a lot. It's still bad, but it's not as bad as it was. They're doing season assists now, as opposed to directly taking someone to court and actively trying to fuck them over, which is something I've heard happened in the 2000s and 90s. Because sure, why not? Again, this is coming from the company that has an actual character named Sherlock Obi-Wan Clouseau. Or is it Obi-Wan Sherlock Clouseau? I don't remember. I don't care. But that is a thing they did. And if you can smell the Disney lawsuit, they probably can too. And we would gladly recommend anyone stops talking about ever in any way, shape, or form. From the shadows of this, however, a new series began to appear on the Alpha Buser YouTube channel. And while the loss of text-to-speech stings, if we were to never get it back, this new series is a pretty damned good yeah. consolation prize. And that's Although I'd also add in one of the extra ones would be some of the side works they've done with other people taking over the main role in the port. Uh, I think it was Speaker D did a few works on the fan, not the animation, the actual lore of from White Wolf from the... I just said the word in the entire series and I completely forgot it. Wow. 
massive brain fart right there. But the world this is a world of darkness. There it is. The world of darkness, specifically, specifically, well, specifically the old world of darkness. And those were fun and how they broke it down. So those two, just like moving outside of the usual mold and going to more informative content was really good. It's not just that they can do this style of humor. It's that they have a lot of ability to do a lot of different content. And whatever those little ending segments are that are always entirely weird and gone anywhere from movie bits to fake documentaries and music videos. Yeah, they're weird. Series is Hunter the Parenting. 2006, yeah. Have we arrived? About fucking time! From the first Hunter episode, the yeah. is based on World of Darkness, a sort of shared universe multimedia series primarily based on a series of tabletop role-playing games. The series at large is a bit of an open presence first? within broader yeah, culture. I guess makes sense. The series of games are Hunter the Reckoning, Werewolf the Apocalypse, Demon the Fallen, Mage the Ascension, Wraith the Oblivion, and without question the most famous and well-known one, Vampire the Masquerade. Before I knew anything about White Wolf, before I knew anything about RPGs, I heard of Vampire the Masquerade as much as D&D, before I got into either of them. I had no idea I was getting into it, I never found out anything, but even I had heard about this before I got into any nerd shit. Frankly, I wish I had earlier because nerd shit's awesome. But this is so famous that it broke into stupid idiots' heads a decade ago. 15, 20, 20 years ago. Oh, shit. 20 years ago. Wow, I feel old. And yes, I would have been about 13 at the time. I have no idea why I found this out. Hmm. Probably internet. Other games exist within the series, but what's a oh, good that even Deviant, without I've knowing that it about. relates to the world of darkness, a lot of people Whoa. will have at least heard of Vampire the Masquerade. I know I heard of Vampire the Masquerade just through cultural osmosis. Yep. Though for the longest time, I had no idea what it actually was. I learned that it was a media franchise through knowing of the existence of the Bloodlines games, but I was completely Never got unaware to play that. that it was originally a tabletop game or part of World of Darkness. I didn't even know that World of Darkness was a thing. Initially, I was rather hesitant to try Hunter the Parenting. The wounds of text to speech were still fresh, and I'm the kind of person that needs to be in a certain mood to try certain things. Yeah, yeah, I get that. Oh, and he's... Oh! I referenced the Speaker D videos going into the detail about the world, and this is the video! That's actually the video he's talking about. This is the thumbnail they used when he went into the overall detail that they used in their creation of the... If the, Not the Emperor, yeah, text speech device. Uh, to create Hunter the Parenting. Uh. <laughs> However, one day the Alpha Abuse channel released a video called Gothic Horror, RPGs set in your hometown, an intro to World of Darkness. Yep. I left it for a few days and then felt myself getting in the mood to try something new, so I checked out this video. It set the scene incredibly well about a secret underworld hidden from the view of the regular mundane world. Yep. About how intricately it had been weaved into be part of the natural world. If anything, this is the greatest way to introduce you to Hunter the Parenting by showing you the world they're in and then going from this is the seriousness nature of it. This is the kind of concepts we have. There's a lot of teamwork involved, but there's a lot of really bad shit out there, man. And then dropping into Hunter and it'll be the same kind of whiplash that TTS had going from this is a much more lighthearted series that has darkness in a setting that is just dark, but has some light. It's the same thing. It's why it's a spiritual successor. If this had come out first, it probably would have helped so much. At least in my own understanding, instead of having to go through comments where people admittedly told me everything I needed, but they were so incredibly detailed, my mind glossed over because people who know about this series know a lot about it. And admittedly, they're really friendly and shared all the information freely. I'm just an idiot. Seeking to make its existence nothing more than a fairy tale. Hidden messages, flickering lights of rundown apartments, eyes that follow you in the dark, spirits that you cannot hear, and the predators that you cannot know. But even knowing of the existence of these things that lurk in the dark is a threat to your own life. It conveyed the dark nature of the world, its intrigue, its horror, its world of darkness. Well, you can throw all that in the garbage because World of Darkness is also clown world. Hello, welcome. Yep. Dracula is real. Because okay. Of vampirism and everyone hates him because he's famous. What? All right. It's an evil fast food chain <laughs> that puts literal demons into their cheeseburgers. Uh, what? Yeah, that one doesn't seem that weird to me still. I know it's supposed to be like, hey, this is insane. I'm just sitting here going like, dude. It's basically Burger King at that point. Wait, what? Owned by the same corporate death 
cult that owns Wait, the evil beer moment. company yeah, yeah, doing the same are these people? thing to their beverages. The reason what? they do this? To suddenly convince random people to beat their wives. What? This is not a joke. You want more? Oh, I can give you more. In 1914, okay. a deranged inventor named Sir Varga was so disgusted at the capacity for mankind to destroy okay. a giant Zeppelin armada what? for what? Earth City. It, and what? declared himself world emperor. Excuse me? Squad, composed of secret agents, killer robots, and fire. Who are these people? Barely able to force them to retreat. And what? then a real life scientist, Michael Faraday, bit so Faraday him cage. so hard they both exploded. What? And everyone on Earth just forgot this ever happened because the new world the order covered it up. Of I course. I feel insane. And I'm not yeah. even talking about the steampunk explorers fighting. Uh, yeah. This is why. This is why I absolutely love this setting because it has that overarching veneer of darkness but that it never lost that entire absolute batshit insanity that 40k is kind of glossed over entirely but then tts brought up and i absolutely loved it for nazis on the hollow earth where, the, who, where the what? ancient kingdoms the, what? of the lizard gang what? are setting the, is off its shit yep I, I, I get where the, this guy's coming what, from right now the, it's well, weird. I can't argue with that, I suppose. All right, fine, I'll try your bloody vampire <laughs> series. <laughs> Don't you get smug with me. Okay, I love the editing right here. Just waiting to put the glasses on. Right as he gives in to do it. Oh. <laughs> I appreciate good editing, mostly because I've tried. I suck at it, but I recognize it's a lot harder than I thought it was. Speak a day. The short Hunter the Parenting follows a family of hunters in the East Anglia region of England as they engage with various aspects from the world of darkness. From vampires to werewolves to mages to ghouls to weird dream holes in the backs of convenience yeah. stores. In what I like to assume was a thinly veiled piss off in the face to Games Workshop, the cast are mostly a group of XPs from text to speech just transferred into the world of darkness setting. Just in case you don't know what an XP is, it's essentially where you export a character from one series to another, change them a bit to make them distinct, and then reuse them. Admittedly, that is functionally what happened, but in the releases Alpha Boost put out, he did specifically say these were spiritual successors. They're not the same character. They are very distinct in what happened to them, they're more like similar life state, but a different way to reach it. And they're going to go to different locations in the sense that, well, I mean, Big D can actually get out of his chair. But that's a bit on the nose. I guess well, that'd be toes at that point. Though, so don't let any of that discourage you if you haven't seen Hunter. While they are thinly veiled, legally distinct remakes of the TTS crew. And also way better animated. It improves drastically per every single episode. For example... Just right here, this is the style of animation in the very first episode. And this is a walking animation they had later on. Even just paused, you can see that there's just so much detail. I think also they refined the lines down where the first one was supposed to almost look like a either a crayon or a pencil had drawn it, like a colored pencil. I haven't done it in a long time, so I'm not actually sure if it does look like a colored pencil. I'm assuming a crayon, though. And that style, I think they kept a lot of it, but toned it down to make it look more clean. And frankly... The animations are insanely good. It just keeps improving. It is such a tour de force when it comes to their ability to animate their shows. There are enough differences that make them distinct from their source material that make them interesting in this new setting and feel How like they new walk, characters. How they where they're walking also, from, you haven't seen TTS since it just comes across as a bunch of very well-written characters in this new setting. In fact, I yep. think that that's the best way to engage with the series personally. I tend to treat them as entirely distinct entities. Kitten and Boy were, in essence, fully original characters from the get-go, yep. and so they've been transferred more or less wholesale from text-to-speech with only very minor differences in their personalities and roles. In this universe, rather than being a sort of protege of Brutal Dawn, Boy Flat is actually son. the son of Dor. T his name is Dor. Dor. Dawn. Dor. Do, do, do you get it? I told you the distinctions were paper thin. Speaking yep. of which, Dor is a very blunt individual. He's ex-military and is a general handyman who barely understands analogies, figures of speech, or naming conventions. Probably explains why he named his son Boy, actually. Yeah. It's consistent with his TTS counterpart, but unlike Dawn, Dawn seems to have a lot more emotional variety, showing fear, a callous, and even slightly sadistic streak in terms of dealing with vampires, and emotional awareness around his brother when he's dealing with stress and mental anguish. He's also. Also, I just. It literally took me this long to notice it. He's an incredibly square, straightforward person. So they literally gave him a square head. I. Probably should have noticed that sooner, but it literally just hit me now. He's also American. He yeah, American. 
Isn't it awful? <laughs> Speaking of his brother, Horrible, Marcus, truly. He's an XP of Magnus the Red, oh, who nice. probably wins my award Somehow. for my favorite character in the TTS series. Very intelligent and dedicated to scholarly pursuits. But the right information is very capable of making the correct choices. Issue is, he's rarely given the correct information, so most of his choices end in absolute horrible, hilarious failure. And to be fair, jumping out the window was a bad idea, regardless. Uh, and it is one of the things how in TTS, Magnus wasn't the closest person, became such a favorite. He felt like he was integral to the story. And I mean, he also then was integral to the story. In this one, though, it's not so much the integral to the story. It's more, you can tell that Magnus, sorry, Marcus is basically the closest character to acting like the son of Big D because he's so much like Big D and how they express themselves. Just it's the lack of information, the general insanity, the absolute bravado and confidence in themselves. It's such a cool way to look at it. And also just the antagonism they're carrying over from the previous show, but also holding true to this one, but less defined. Also randomly Horace's horse. Sure. Why not? This bothers him constantly, despite him really wanting to do the right thing. He's also romantically involved with and engaged to Kitten. Now in TTS, I, I wouldn't engage? have liked this since oh. it felt like Magnus was manipulating Kitten a lot of the time. In Hunter though, Kitten and Marcus genuinely are really cute together. Kitten in TTS they acted a as a sort of vehicle for lore dumps. He was the one who relayed information to the Emperor and by extension the viewer. Because this was his role, he had a nearly encyclopedic knowledge of the state of the galaxy in the Warhammer setting. In Hunter, this has been flipped on its head somewhat. He's still very intelligent and has a lot of knowledge about East Anglia since he grew up there. But, but he's having a collection of myths and folklore tales to pull from, but he is very much not all-knowing about vampires, mages, werewolves and the likes. He has a voracious curiosity about them though, and attempts to learn as much as he can from wherever he can. From groups of other people in the know like the Arcanum, vampires themselves, or D. And speaking of which, we can finally get to the biggest character change of all. I just realized we are almost 14 minutes, eh, 13 and a half minutes in, and we haven't even got to the main point of the entire video, an analysis of Big D. We've just been getting the lead into how the character was created and what the setting that was created after TTS was. And I like how he's looking into this. Frankly, this is really good. I'm just actually just going to go down there and subscribe right now. If you haven't already, go do that. This guy's definitely earned it already. All. And the main thing that I wanted to talk about, the character of Big D. Yes, that is so his name. Over the top. I love it. Into the dread inferno Walmart? and see his fearful hide burn away in the conflagration. <laughs> <sighs> I always love the over the top faces. They're so freaking funny, man. Thank you so much, man. Yeah, Cosmic Void. Thank you for dropping those in. They're just so damn good. And with that, you have seen about half of how he acts. Yep. In my opinion, the more boring half. Not that it's boring in the least, mind you. Let me explain. Talking about Big D without talking oh, about the world of from. darkness and Hunter the Parenting broadly is a bit like trying to talk about King Alfred the Great without explaining the state of England at the time. I mean, you can do it. I'm not English. I got no idea what any of this is about. Although, what he's probably going to bring up is how Big D is outwardly insane. He's outwardly mad and you should just ignore him because everything he says is stupid. But in some of the smaller episodes, including a few that were more sporadic and done in his homage to people, he has a dark, sad, brooding nature that has information that he feels burdened by that he can't get rid of. He has power that he can't tell and act on and he has knowledge that could hurt the people he wants to help with it. And he's aware of all that. And the insanity is sometimes a cover, sometimes a defense mechanism, sometimes actually just him being bash and insane. But it's such a great character to have those multiple layers to work through. I'm assuming that's where we're going to get to here, because this metaphor I'm going to miss altogether, because I have no idea who it is. I'm literally the person he's talking about right now. But you'd be missing out a huge chunk of what it was exactly that made him such a well-known or remarkable figure for his time. Once you understand the world that he lived in, 
you can also begin to understand why he's such a famous figure and why he's the only English monarch to ever be titled the Great. Really? This is why, in spite of him being the main reason I wanted to make this analysis in the first place, I've been able to get this far into it while barely even talking about D in any capacity. The world and setting he finds himself in are as much a contribution to how fascinating I find him as he himself is. If he wasn't part of World of Darkness or some other equally grim one. universe, I don't think he would then. be nearly as noteworthy as he is. Oh, so, the interview. Who is D? Unlike the other characters in the series who are near explicitly XPs of their TTS counterparts, it would be more accurate to call D a spiritual successor to the Emperor. This is alluded to in a number of ways, even an indirect one. I mean, it's. It's not even that it's fair to call it that. Alpha Busa explicitly called it that. And I guess you could say Boy and Kitten are probably the closest, minus Boy's biggest change is actually being in the family rather than being adopted in. And Kitten's biggest change is he's not the encyclopedic know it all who is definitely in charge and everyone else just has to realize it eventually. I know what I said, I'm standing by it. As opposed to what Kit or I think it's still Kitten. Yeah, it just it's a small change just on knowledge base there. These guys, more emotional. Less actually made horrible mistakes in the past, actually, is his biggest change. Big D seems significantly different, but also because the Emperor was always mysterious enough that we couldn't really get the backstory. And what we got was huge and probably still accurate. Bonds. From every other character being an XP as well, to his color scheme favoring gold to him looking similar to the Emperor in his pre-Golden Throne state, oh, to him yeah. being implied to be in from a that. similar area in what is contemporary 21st century Turkey, to them both having a great many number of children and having a great deal of knowledge that very few others are privy to. It's a yeah. very clear allusion to anyone who has seen both series, but outside of these things, that's kind of it. Once these are put aside, these are two radically different characters. Now granted, those are quite a few things, but they're pretty surface level things. The having Middle Eastern origins or wearing gold or bearing a visual similarity to the Emperor are quite basic things which ultimately serve more as nods to TTS more than anything else. Admittedly, it's that line between XB and the spiritual successor. I don't... I would consider them all spiritual successors rather than XBs because they're not copy and pasted. They're significantly different. But I think a lot of the reason he's going here is while we've had episodes with some information about everyone... It's usually just in how they personally engage. And frankly, I love that, so I never really had a problem with it. But a lot of the lore and the backstory that's the most fascinating is Big D. So we've actually got more of the differences between him and what he was definitely based on. So he feels more like a successor as opposed to a direct copy and paste in with a few edited changes. It's the difference between the Aeneid to anything by Homer for the Trojan War. And yeah, I literally just forgot the name of the book Homer wrote about the Trojan War. I, I do not know why I forgot that. Wow. I'm an English major. I just forgot an obvious book. This is embarrassing. It's that difference of this is something that came after and it does a lot of homage to it, but it's not just a copy and paste as opposed to Fifty Shades of Grey being a copy and paste of fan fiction for Twilight and somehow making Twilight look better by comparison. I know what I said. And I hate I know why I said it. If you have questions, do not look up videos of me having to read Fifty Shades of Grey on stream because I hate every second about this. And I'm absolutely disappointed that YouTube didn't suppress that video. It would have given me a reason not to make more. I just need just blocking the thought, blocking that thought process. It doesn't happen. I have nothing I have to no, nothing, nothing to think about there. I don't have to do it twice more still. So. <sighs> It's not like Kitten or Boy, where they're more or less direct reintroductions, or like Marcus or Dawn, where they're reimagined in a new setting. D diverges so radically from the Emperor in terms of his actual personality that Does it feels he bizarre to me to even compare the two all that much. He's entirely new. D is the de facto patriarch of the family and their leader in engagements with the supernatural. See, that's the thing. I'm not sure he does diverge from the Emperor that much. But also because what we were getting was a heavily filtered emperor whose entire thought process was, oh god, what the fuck is going on now? This is someone who can still act, where it's almost like a earlier version of him. So much younger and hopeful. It, 
I can't say he doesn't act like the Emperor would. For all we know, it is. They just never got to points where that would come up in TTS. Maybe if that had gone on longer, we would get more information about that. Or, you know, another episode, and I would, I would be fine with that. Just, just hurting myself for bringing it up right now. Just hurting myself to bring it up. Yeah. Having extensive experience and knowledge about the world beyond the mundane. There's a great number of things that I find to be deeply compelling about D. The first one being that he's near completely insane. Yes. You're what? All right, whatever. I don't respect the time. It's an urgent cause. Now listen up. All right, gremlins, who I know live in the undercarriage of this bus. Chances! I will be back soon. So do not the best part is they probably actually worth things insane. living down there. Don't mock me, Philistines! I'll kill you, Necromancer! I'll kill all of you! Ah! I'll break it up! Yep. Do you want to hear more Norfolk Urban Legends? Of course. Sure, it sounds ridiculous <laughs> to you, but so did walruses until we had photos of them. For fuck's sake, man. Tusks on a manager. <laughs> yep. Your people's rejection of your own language is inspiring. I'm being as it's true. I will kill the queen. But yes. What? D? D, what did you do? Holy shit, man. I'm sorry. I knew about both these, but I never... I did it. Whenever the next video comes out, if they don't make a nod to this somehow, I would actually think that's probably a good choice because that is dark, man. Oh. Oh. The second is that he's very much a family man. He seems to deeply enjoy being a father, and a grandfather in particular. He has a very friendly relationship with Kitten, referring to him as his son-in-law even when he and Marcus aren't actually married, and treats him like one of his own children. He enjoys family outings, and keeps extensive photo albums. He's very open with his affections, particularly towards Boy. Of course, that isn't to say he's perfect in this respect by any stretch of yep. the imagination. Far from it. He is very capable of getting frustrated and angry with them at times, mostly when they screw up in major ways. Despite having these affections for his family, he is incredibly bad at actually showing it a lot of the time. He thinks incredibly highly of Marcus's intelligence, considering him to be a genius, but never actually tells him that directly. In fact, during the first arc, nearly all he does is verbally deride Marcus's intelligence due to really trying not to spoil here. Marcus making a terrible, terrible decision that he had no way of knowing would backfire in a spectacular manner as it did end up doing. You know, I was going to say something, but I'm going to respect the initial impetus of this entire video and not say a word. Because if you've got to this point and you haven't seen this show, go watch it. Also, I will probably fuck up and say something spoilery after this, so uh, that's the advance warning. I will do it, because I know me. I do that kind of shit. Because D wouldn't tell him anything about the situation at hand. But this in particular is a source of friction between Marx and D. In both scenarios, though, both are presented as having very valid points. Which brings me on to my third point, which is the second most compelling thing about him to They're me. Still acting Despite his family? the sheer madness he displays, D is clearly deeply intelligent. Vampires in World of Darkness will hunt down any breach in their security with extensive vigor. If you know the mm -hmm. names of their various clans, for instance, or you say them aloud, or there is even a hint that you know about their existence, this is known as the Masquerade. So while he knows about the names of, for example, the various vampire clans, he teaches his sons to use aliases instead of their actual names, to keep them safe. This gets demonstrated in the very first episode, where Kitten refers to four vampires they track down by these aliases, such as calling a Nosferatu a Sludge Lad. This allows them to identify different kinds of vampires while not risking breaching the masquerade in such a way as to warrant them being hunted down. D also openly admits this to Kitten in an audio log when he asks. Uh, sludge Lad? Not the right. Um, is it? Oh, no. It's actually a pretty clever way of getting around the dangers associated with masquerade breaches. Whilst huh. Honestly, I thought that was just them working off ignorance, but I guess that does make more sense when looked at this way. It's a different interpretation, and I'm not entirely sure that was right or not. I mean, for Big D, it's definitely accurate. I have no doubt in that. But I was under the impression, especially for Kitten, that no, 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 this is what he thought was accurate, not that he was intentionally misusing an alias. 
although the point uh, Cosmic is making is that Big D is doing intentionally wrong issues. Although I think in his case, he's intentionally allowing wrong information to go out because that's safer than having the right information out. But that also led into the issues with Marcus as well, so it makes sense. Still giving them enough to work on, identify their enemies, and plan accordingly around them. A Nosferatu vampire, a Grangel vampire, and a Tremere vampire are all distinct and can possess different abilities. So giving them fake identifications is a good way of being able to identify the threats that each poses without having to risk them being hunted for breaching the masquerade. The sheer degree to which this is necessary is demonstrated in another audio log, where mm -hmm. he has to play a mental game of wits and harmonize various conflicting testimonies given to the police, while being unsure if the officer he's being interviewed by is a ghoul or not, a ghoul being a sort of human servant for vampires. For all his absolute madness, it is very evident that Again, one of those moments that might be spoilery. This right here is such a deep dive episode into everything going on in Big D's head that it is one of the most fascinating internal monologues I've ever heard on YouTube in general. Mostly because, frankly, I haven't heard many good internal monologues in general. Usually they get very washed out when read out loud. Usually you just get more down in writing, but that's just because they don't translate that well to make interesting TV or interesting YouTube videos. Somehow, though, that format doesn't have that issue with everything Alpha Boost has done. So we get moments like this where so much of it is just writing appearing on the screen and Big D reading out his over-the-top voice, but then getting very serious to show his intensity. And that's one of the way, because the vocal acting in the show was carrying a lot of water that other shows would put onto the action and the flash, the pizzazz that most of the on-screen images would cover. It actually works really well. Could not translate to TV, but it works on YouTube because the medium is accepted by the audience it already has. The D isn't actually insane. At least, not to the extent that he can't perceive reality. Highly eccentric and flawed for certain, but he knows what he's doing. Throughout this particular interview, which is one of my favorite mm -hmm. pieces of this mm -hmm. series, we see these four processes in action, in how he deals with the officer, and it's a glimpse into how he views the world. He's able to think ahead, it's dark. come up with convincing lies, it's using aware the truth of the darkness. just enough to add credibility to his story, and just throw also darkness attempting third time. to harmonize conflicting testimonies his family tone. have given about the situation, and also knowing exactly who made what mistakes in their stories based on the nature of them. He's able to figure out that Kitten made the incident in question seem like a well-natured affair which goes against what D would have rathered. He can also tell who chooses the wrong words or when Marcus is going down the path that he wants him to. And throughout all of this, he is just as eccentric and loud and roundabout and bonkers as he is throughout the rest of the series. If there you act crazy, is a people rhyme and you. reason to what he's worked. doing. One small thing that I do find interesting about this whole interview, he assumes another person's identity. The issue is he takes the identity of someone who is reported as missing by a woman named Caitlin. The guess is that this is their mother, but it's actually their sister. This is a very subtle thing, but he refers to it as him having made a mistake, which... I disagree with. I mean, sure, the person whom he's pretending to be, a vampire wizard by the name of Kevin, is locked in his makeshift prison. We, we, we'll get to that. It's not what it looks like, I promise. So he Are we sure about that? Are we sure it's not exactly what it looks like? Because they got a bromance going on, all right. He could have asked him in order to prepare better, though the sequence of events that followed wouldn't have given him enough time to do so, and he had no reason to suspect that he would be taken in by the police. But in World of Darkness, you only really get one chance. If you mess up, you are going to become vampire dinner. But the reason I don't call this a mistake is this. He knows only a little about Kevin's personal life. He had no way of knowing that he had a sister, and in the world of the mundane at this point in time, people need a mother in order to be actually born. Maybe they're not involved in the person's life in any real What? He had no way of knowing that he had a sister, and in the world of the mundane at this point in time, people need a mother in order to be actually born. At this time, they need a mother. What the hell happened in later New World of Darkness that that became a thing that he had to clarify was that this time... I mean, it could just be rhetorical flourish right now, and I'm going to hope for that one, because that is getting really Krieg on us, and that is kind of fucked up. Maybe they're not involved in the person's life in any real way, but they still gave birth to them. 
Everyone having a birth mother is the one certainty he can rely on. Not everyone has a sister. I wouldn't call this a mistake. I'd call this the best guess he could make with the information he had to hand. A sister it might was be the too intelligent obvious, move to make, even if it ended up being wrong. But this is later reflected upon in the very next audio log. What the experienced is something of a microcosm with what he puts his sons through in the previous episodes. D didn't have enough information about Kevin's family and made a mistake that nearly cost him dearly. Marcus didn't have enough information on, again trying not to spoil here, the situation he was in, so he made a mistake that nearly cost him dearly. He Although, let's put the blame where it's at. It wasn't just Marcus. Dor was just as involved in this one and very much in favor of it. He shows off a contemplative side, wondering if he just told them the information if things might turn out better. He comes across as deeply conflicted and introspective in a way that only someone burdened by the full knowledge of the threat that he and his children face in the world of darkness can be. I just find him deeply fascinating and well written a character for all of this. But what I find perhaps the most interesting thing about D isn't necessarily any of that. It's actually two things in particular that sell him as a character to me. In one audio lock. I'm going to take a wild guess because I have an idea what might be the more interesting things. Part of it might actually be the moment on screen right now. The parts where Big D second guesses, where he doubts himself, where he confronts his own actions. Something the Emperor never could do. Mostly because he was a shattered psyche and the parts of him that were actually screaming to do something different were literally not present. And partially because the entire character was comedic most of the time where this one big d is comedic most of the time but the times he isn't are very humanizing and introspective to such a degree that they are incredibly poignant that would be one point the other one is probably that he is absolutely batshit insane but he said that was the less interesting one i have no idea what the second one is then hmm. i mean for me it was a batshit but that's just because i like the wacky in particular. Namely, he's an optimist and that he's hilarious. But that hilarity optimist? comes from the fact that he is an optimist. The audio log in question is called The Probing of Kevin and it's the one that fully sold me on Hunter the Parenting, perhaps even more so than any- You know what? I never actually thought of him as an optimist that way, but I guess when you look at it as he would be willing to make deals, spoiler, with Kevin at all, that he was willing to see the best in someone and not what that someone was, is very much an interesting aspect that can't exist in 40k even when it does exist in tts here though big d actively was trying to come to an agreement and got it and embraced someone who probably by all rights should have been their mortal enemy hell started that way yeah i guess i could see how this would be considered optimism it literally wasn't something i ever considered but when you put it in such an obvious way it does make sense. I can see where Cosmic is going with this one. Any of the actual episodes. As a bit of a lead up into this, Kevin is a vampire wizard whom the family captured in the very <laughs> first episode. Kevin was brought to be interrogated by D, who mostly just talks with him for the most part, and they get one hell of a good rapport going. They bounce on yep. one another incredibly well and actually seem to quite like one another. As a side note, compared to his sons, D is actually relatively civilized in his interrogation. I mean, he does smack Kevin with a pan a couple of times, but like 83.7% of the time, Kevin does have it coming. And I just realized the reason why. With his sons, he's trying to protect them so that they don't get effed over. Kevin is already in the position where it's too late to worry about that. He has got the target on his back because of everything that has happened, because of the groups he's joined. He is already in the position where the thing that Big D wants to protect his kids from is already going to go after Kevin. So Big D doesn't have to hide as much. He can just be himself to a much greater extent and just talk about things. He's still hiding a lot, obviously, but it's to a much lesser extent. I guess it makes it more relaxing in general for him. It's like, yeah, you're already in a really bad, shitty situation, so I can't really make it worse. Neat. Oh, so you're an up-and-coming landlord? Lord is out! Your housing should not be a commodity! <laughs> but they just talk for the most part. First about mundane things like jobs, housing, economic insecurity, and the likes, which is actually a far more effective method of interrogation than torture, since it's more yep. reliable and requires an acknowledgement of the subject's humanity. I bring this up because I do not... Uh, just to clarify that point, the problem with torture is that you will tell people anything they want to hear to make pain stop. That is why anything under torture is inherently useless because 
any time you put into it would be better just to ask someone else who doesn't know that they're being interrogated. You know, just randomly go out and look at something. Because if you're torturing someone, they will tell you what everyone here. You want to get someone to confess that they killed Adolf Hitler in the 1900s? And I don't mean the 1900s as in that century. I mean, maybe seconds after the Big Bang. 1900 seconds in. I have no idea how many minutes because I can't do math. Yeah, sure. They will admit to that. They will say that they're Godzilla writing Abraham Lincoln. And how that works out? Well, Abraham Lincoln's hat just got really big. And we're not going to do any window on that one. And someone will fully say and convince themselves it's real and tell you what they believe is the truth at that point to make it stop. So Big D's actually doing a really good interrogation because he's not doing the TV told me that this is cool moment. Because so many idiots believe it's real. I do not believe that Dee's doing this unintentionally. Kevin, for the record, is my favorite character in the series. Really? He's an absolute delight. I adore him. He's a very average to really make guy. A choice about that. In his human life, he was an accountant. The most horrifying job I can conceive of because fuck numbers. Now yes. That skill is part of why he was valuable to his clan, since he could use his knowledge of finance to help them achieve their goals undetected. In addition, he maintains huge ties to his human life, including owning an apartment, pretending to be alive so no one thinks he's gone missing, and also has a cat. Well, let me break free so I can go home and feed my cat! You, 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 wait, you have a cat? Oh no, I told the evil Mr. Smurples! <laughs> This is why I it's love this guy. Name. This goes in direct opposition to the fact that he's aligned himself with a group called the Sabbat, essentially vampire supremacists, or according to another, the Arcanite naturalists, uh, who reject yeah. their humanity and want to overthrow the masquerade and treat humans as livestock. In comparison to them, and even the rest of Dee's family, Kevin is just so normal. normal. And more yeah. than that, in spite of literally being a vampire wizard, He's the most human out of anyone. His conversation is a bit of a bizarre one where Kevin is defending concepts like taxes and the merit of vegetables. What? This was such an interesting piece right here because the interrogation itself highlighted that this is a man tied up, chained up, a vampire who's got his eyes gouged out, is stripped down, is beat to shit. He's got his captor who's this probably maybe immortal maybe human i don't know i don't think anyone does at this point because it's still mysterious interrogating him after all this crazy stuff have gone down and they're arguing about the most mundane aspects for so much of it and the dichotomy there is absolutely fascinating seeing how their minds work on normal day-to-day -day things it might not work for everyone but frankly i found that absolutely fascinating seeing how they would latch on to certain things to show their personality and how like he said, this Kevin was the most human because he really did kind of fit with the most normal interpretation of humanity, where Big D could fit with a more classical human. The more Romanesque, I killed everyone else so they can't say it's not mine anymore attitude. Yeah, that sounds pretty much like what the Roman Empire did. We came, we saw, we stole, and some people might have survived, and we're mistaken about that. D argues against them. The vampire is defending human civilization while the human rails against it. D even mm -hmm. says that by all rights he should stay Kevin for the sun to claim him, but he can't actually bring himself to do it. He even suggests that Kevin join him in his goals. During that entire sequence, this exchange happens. Oh. Why would I serve the first murderer when I can kill him myself? Cain is the first vampire in World of Darkness. He was cursed by the Abrahamic God, which, you know, thanks, God. That, that's what the rest of us needed, to be hunted. Admittedly, from what I've been told, Cain is pretty chill. Sometimes. At least in this setting. Also, the entire stat sheet is, you lose. Hunted down by vampires and literally eaten alive so you could spite Cain. That, yeah, his, his successor is not Wonderful. so chill. Thank you. And Kevin is not exaggerating in any way, shape, or form. This is not a joke. Someone once made a character sheet that aptly describes the situation with Kane. You fucking Ooh, lose. Ooh, better. Is this in some, maybe there's a secret. Health, not really hurt at all, not really hurt at all, not really hurt at all. Only a flesh wound. The fact that you can get that far is more than I'm expecting. Blood pool. Merits and flaws don't matter. Humanity, one. Willpower. I can't see any dots on that one. 
Player, Varen. Nature, Trickster. Generation, First. Sire, God. Demeanor, Curmudgeon. <laughs> Chronicle, yours. Sorry. By or, but what if, or, but what if he went to begin to, no. Horrible parenting skills. You cannot skills kill Cain. This is a law of reality. If you have two apples, and I give you two other apples, you do not spontaneously materialize ten additional apples. You have four. This is a law of reality. You cannot break it. Just like you cannot kill Cain. And he I mean, I know enough about Wizard, the, so that, uh, or sorry, not Wizard, mages in this setting. Reality is more malleable on this one. He was D, just brushing all of that off. He's incredibly confident in his ability to, in this case, quite literally defy reality and God. This isn't even the first time chronologically he's done this, though. He's done this with mages in the audio log prior to the probing of Kevin. Mages in World of Darkness are... Uh, how do I put this? Okay. Audio so you know the concept mages? of a creator god? Did I miss that? Just make things because they want to. Mages are that powerful. Near infinite power to alter reality with their thoughts and wills. And people have told me that they've explicitly kicked God out of heaven, who might also not be this one, but is this one, and it's weird. And God is a machine sometimes, sometimes he's not. There's a lot of different settings, and some work better together than others. I don't know what the hell's going on half the time. It probably makes sense to someone. I'm not that someone. Other than mages are broken. But also sound really fun. I like broken characters. Also, apparently they're having a war on the moons of Saturn and Jupiter using portals. Of what relevance is this? That's None whatsoever, but I'll be damned if I talk about mages without bringing up the moon hopping wars. Anyway, yes, mages Ugh. is gods. Uh, you're going to cry about it? No, you're not. Do you want to know why? Because a mage decided you don't have tear ducts anymore. You can't cry about it. Fuck you. And D sums it up by basically saying... Is that a nerd you can easily punch? D, are you fully aware of the power they possess? Oh, actually, they can warp reality with their wheels and brains. Yeah. What? Oh, yeah, near infinite power to He's aware of it. <laughs> oh. Yes, apparently. All right. He does this with practically everything. I mean, from what I've heard, though, the oh shit, you've already lost ability is so high level that it is hard to reach. And also earlier level, punching them is a good choice. Generally much more acquable. Acquable? Wow. Actionable than anything else. Except for werewolves who immediately start out at such a high level by comparison to what everyone else gets up to eventually that high level, everyone broken. High level mage, broken. High level werewolf, broken. Early level mage, squishy. Early level werewolf, still broken, is how it's been explained to me. I haven't played werewolf. And it does frankly come across as absolutely insane. D acts absurdly a lot, but it's clear he knows what he's doing, that he has his plans, that he's fully aware of the dangers around him. In fact, shortly after his comments on wizards, the conversation between him and Kitten turns to werewolves. And when Kitten suggests that they might be able to take on a werewolf, D completely drops any and all pretense and becomes brutally serious. Yeah. And this is actually something really interesting. This is one of those audio logs that had come off most of Big D being crazy. Had most of his characterization being over the top and insane. And admittedly, really freaking fun for that. But breaking character here, having him become serious, because there was that bit of information he thought was so important that he needed to tell them. This moment right here, it might not be the first time, because I'm pretty sure there had to be one I missed prior to this. But it's the one that stood out to me the most because... This showed Big D without the mask, without hiding his knowledge, without the ha 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 ha, this is insane, ha ah, moments. And it frankly holds so much water as a great establishing moment. Yeah, I heard they're tough. But with yeah. how well we did in the tunnels against those vampires, I'm confident that... No. What? You aren't ready to fight a werewolf son-in-law, not yet. The fledglings we fought were fearsome, yes, but a werewolf. Listen well. Werewolves are killing machines. They are supernatural yep. soldiers fighting a war we barely And he's understand. aware of the war because of that, too. Do not fight them. These are major contradictions that occur from sentence to sentence in some cases. Then the scene happens. If you're familiar with Hunter the Parenting and the probing of Kevin, you already know exactly which scene I mean. And if you don't, 
And there are no words that I can say that will describe this Spoilers scene incoming. without just allowing it to play in its entirety. What is more liberating? The band of monsters forcing you to erase your humanity? The maniacal sorceress tossing you aside like a ragdoll? Or rejecting both? To face the world down, head to head, and dare it to stop you? The freedom that comes from either worthy death or triumphant victory? Allow me to tell you a parable. A parable about one named Kevin Westworth. Kevin was born in Ipswich to a middle-class family. His parents were devout followers of the status quo and primed him with all the tools necessary to lead a pleasant, stagnant, unexceptional life. Kevin became an accountant, about the only field in which he truly excelled. I'll be honest, there's a lot of moments here that stood out to me more than this one, but that's just personal taste, probably. But hearing this again, it does highlight the major difference. Not just that he's the most human, it's that tonal shift from Big D's grandiosity down to Kevin just saying like, okay, bring it down to reality, man. Which admittedly is weird in a fantasy, urban fantasy, whatever setting in general. So it stands out quite well for that. But his dream was always to accomplish something more. So he broke away from his life in the suburbs, moved a bit further north. He decided he will make it big. He will do something with his life. He failed. And so, Kevin got a job as an accountant in Great Yarmouth. But Kevin never gave up. Don't you understand? Kevin may have been trapped in the mire. He may have been an uninspiring person trapped in a dead-end job. Yep. His dreams and aspirations might have been dying, but they weren't dead. Not completely. He was going to make his name. He was going to make rent every week. Oh, uh, yep. Now we're at the part where I remember I don't like thinking about this one. Because as inspiring as this sounds, that someone failed and got up and tried again, it ends with Kevin saying, and then it got worse after he managed to pull himself together, and now there's no chance. It's one of the reasons I like the ending of it, because, spoilers, Big D gives him an out to get that bit of optimism back. Which is probably why he mentioned Big D is an optimist. That's one of the things... Cosmic likes about him. Okay, that actually makes a lot more sense in this context. He was going to move up, see the world. He was going to do something, anything, to make people know his name. And then Kevin died. And now you know the rest. Well, perhaps I know a part, but neither of us know the ending. Spare me your optimism. It was stolen from me along with my life. You cannot know the feeling of the embrace. To wake one day, your skin cold, your heart still, ravenous, inhuman. Where once there was a world, friends, colleagues. Now there is only prey and treachery. This story comes to no good end. I cannot follow my dreams. I'm a scrounge to stay alive or sane. I... I cannot remain human any longer. My only hope is to embrace a shadow of this dream. To embrace the beast. I hope freedom is on the other side. Okay, this is actually something I missed early on. But as he was speaking, they changed his painting to make it less. A shadow of this dream. The mouth just disappears. To embrace the beast. The brow I goes down, and then he just fully turns in. All you see is a bit of fang through the mouth. I'm kind of surprised I missed that, but I guess I was focusing on this too much. On the other side. Freedom never comes through surrender. Perhaps not. That's the only chance I have left. If you truly believe that, there is little that can be done. The sad quirks of circumstance will see you degenerate into a monster and die as one. But if you so choose, there may be a chance to claw your way out from this. Find a different path. This really was a damn good episode. 
just going to put this on the list of things I need to rewatch right up there with TTS. Even just the audio design that Crow is highlighting is specifically right. Wow, Crow. Sorry, Cosmic. I have different people in my mind who use the Q words. Eh, that Cosmic is pointing out. Just that little way that D is talking much more seriously. And that you could hear the moments of him walking forward, the step, the clinking of the chains as he's unlocking it, giving the option to do something different to break what Kevin was expecting had to be the truth. For all of you. Sound of the door unlocking. You need only <laughs> rise and take it. Damn. This was a good one. It's moments like this that make a character like they. It's what makes him unique, and what made me actually want to go over his character like this. He does not live in a fair world, far from it. He's faced with tragedy and brutality on a regular- Oh, this episode. Earlier I referenced the really dark, brooding episodes where the mask is off, and this was an homage episode done out of personal loss. And frankly, commenting on it, on my end feels wrong because there was much more personal emotion invested into this by the people working on it than just a YouTube video on its own, just a part of the series. This episode was dark and sad and had no real villains and only victims that he just had to let have their end. That was a sad one. Poignant and beautiful, but terrible for it. And he's aware of it because he's bringing it up. Regular basis. He's seen it firsthand. We see it firsthand throughout the series. It's a brutal world, an absurd world. And yet D speaks with such certainty, such confidence, and such regard for humanity and the world as a whole that the only word I can think to use to describe it is regal. D acts like a madman. When he drops the act though and gets serious, he showcases an optimism and humanity that's hard not to be enraptured by. He displays incredible acts of kindness, like listening to an old woman turned vampire as they wait for the sun, the woman choosing to let it claim her. He'll make insane claims, from running gags like the belief that a blender should cost 99 pence due to his belief in humanity's progress, to the idea that Kevin can regain his humanity in a world where he can live the life he wants without fear, to the idea that he can kill Kane. I can't claim to have any idea what these goals actually are because I'm making this before we truly know. Ma On the one hand, yeah, you can make those claims. On the other hand, I think his analysis is pretty accurate to how the character has been portrayed so far. Unless a radical shift happens, and that's entirely possible, it does seem like that's what he's going to. Regal? I wouldn't go so much regal because of his specific hatred of monarchy and controlling systems, but noble in spirit, chivalrous in his own interpretation of what is owed might be a better way to look at it, just because formerly regal would probably be there. I would not be surprised if he was regal, if he was invested in those systems at some point, and that probably led to why he hates it now so vehemently as part of his overt insanity. Whether that's real or not, put on as an act or not, I don't know. And frankly, I would normally assume that it's only partially an act, because that makes it more interesting when it's slightly true. Flat out lies are boring, because you can disregard them. But when you work true, then it makes something so much more fascinating. Maybe he's a mercy hunter. Maybe his plan is to do with Kane what he wants to do with Kevin. Make them re-embrace their humanity, allowing the curse of immortality to fade from Kane. Maybe he wants to merely seal him away. Maybe he has plans on something else. Or maybe he doesn't actually plan on killing Kane. Maybe it's a euphemism or a smokescreen or something else. It doesn't matter. Because D is capable of inspiring belief. And that's what's most important about him and why it's so important that he exists in a world like World of Darkness. And it's why I adore him so much. I actually believe that D is capable of all these things. I mean, he got his 99 pen to blenders, so out of the list I made, he's got a 33% success rate at the very least. Oh. Yeah, yeah, he actually managed to get that too. And also use that as a great transition to get more potentially bigger revelations coming in, and I'm really looking forward to that. But... 
it does seem like what he's talking about now, the reason he likes it, isn't just all the reason he said, but because Big D is that force for good. He is the big good of the series. It's a little on the nose, but it, it fits because that's basically the role the Emperor was in. The biggest good. Because in 40k, they're, he was the best because everyone else is worse. Unless you're an orc, in which case the orcs just loved everything. It was their paradise. But in this one, he can be more conventionally good. And while he's crazy and very much against the status quo because it felt wrong and stifling to so many of his sensibilities, he could do that. That's something I think Bruv Alphabusa could do in Hunter that he was kind of constrained on because the characters just had different approaches and, well, it, because the Emperor was literally constrained to the chair, actual constraints of what they could get away with. Sometimes. It makes sense, though, just giving you that character to jump into a setting on, saying, here is what you focus on, and then build everyone else off of. On his own, Marcus and Kitten might have been interesting. But when played off Big D, it's so much more fascinating because it changes the nature of the narrative. Anyone else, it would be a much darker story of them confronting their ignorance with their own humanity on the line and their own moments of whimsy that are then contrasted to this horrible shit. As opposed to Big D, who has moments of this horrible shit, but he's already made the choice to confront it and fuck it in the face with his fist and maybe kill Kane, who can't be killed because fuck it, I'm doing it. It's over the top, but it's a level of ridiculousness that does change the entire nature of the series. And that makes sense because it makes it easier to immediately jump into something brand new when you have that focal point to branch off from. Which is admittedly what the Emperor did in TTS by acting as a focal point to then draw people into the world itself. A la why I'm now doing this and why I haven't recorded as many videos because I'm painting way too many models, way too detailed in way too many ways. I haven't really figured out what I'm doing yet. It's fun, but it drew me in. Hold on a second, the 99p land store, it's just Poundland made into a 99 cent store. Come on. Wait, those are actually things? When... I'm sorry, I'm not British. Those are real? There's actually a 99 pence, I'm assuming. And there's a pound, so it's a dollar store and a 99 cent store. How can we don't have a 99 cent store in America? We got the equivalent of a dollar. And granted, this would be like dollar fifty land here, so admittedly still better pricing than most things in the dollar store that are like seven bucks. Inflation. Come on. At the end of the scene, when Kevin decides to tell Dee a secret about vampires, Dee chuckles. Some have considered this to be a sinister chuckle, not me. His words prior and the kind of person that he is suggest he that it. he's seen this happen a thousand times, that he fully expected Kevin to reject him, but he didn't. It's a laugh of relief. In the contemporary age of the first quarter of the 21st century, so much media is dark and gritty with protagonists who are also as dark and gritty as their worlds, from cyberpunk dystopias to political thrillers where the explicit belief is, if you are a decent person, you fail, or a I'm looking at you, George R. R. Martin. Apocalypse settings which depict humanity as squabbling loons, or what if superheroes but they're bad people, or the other the mountains of pessimistic trash I witness on the daily, and I'm so tired of it. Not that it doesn't- Yeah, I get that too. Although I wouldn't say it's a lot of trash. Some of it, I mean, Martin is an amazing writer. Not my personal style choice, but I like what he did. ...have its place. Or isn't good or valuable for its insights because it's beyond exhausting and frankly just miserable for the sake of being miserable it is beyond refreshing to see a character exist in such an overwhelmingly dark setting but be a beacon of optimism even in the face of any and all common sense oddly enough the reasoning here is actually something that we've already seen play out in media before what he's talking about is the reference between being the beacon on a hill versus everyone else who's just down in the filth and having to deal with it. This is actually a fluctuating scale of media and how some fictional aspects are made. It's not a current one. It's a very long-standing one. You can see this going back and forth from one pendulum swing to the next in how various tropes are interpreted, mixed, changed, and gone from one side to the next. An easy one to say would just be the swing in the character of Superman. When he came out, it was during... The 20s and 30s, early American history, not earliest, but 
the previous century, maybe halfway in so far, I, I don't do estimates on time well, where things felt like they were changing and then the 30s hit and everything is going weird and wrong. But Superman comes in and he's this bright, shining beacon of this is what could be. It's great and hopeful and good. When everything else could be horrible, there's that great thing. But then they move to the other side, the grittiness, he said. It's like, well, what if Superman was actually not super? And he was weak and other things happened. And all the other characters who came in who are darker. But then you're still going back to that. We have characters now who are those bright, shining beacons on a hill. Because that narrative dissonance and that change between them is kind of a constant thing. And right now it's that other swing is what he's describing. So... I'm going on a literary tangent right now. And again, I, I'm English major, got a master's in this. It's something you see in a lot of writing, how it moves between those extremes of wanting to see hope versus wanting to see the darkness. And it's kind of important to have both because you get very bored with one or the other because it starts feeling fake after so long. Because when everyone's doing it, they're not doing it to show the Ida. Ida? Showing the item, showing the humanity, the id of what is going on. You're just copying a trend. And then the overall quality just degrades and it loses the initial potency that those cautious steps into that new-ish setting would do. D feels like those steps are away from the dark, the grim, the everything is fucked situation. Also, there's probably a correlation between the everything is fucked situation following real life hitting a everything is fucked situation. For example, 2020. You can correlate how many people did dark, depressing, post-apocalyptic worlds. And you're going to quickly see within the next five years, maybe 10 years, there's going to be a slow, slow, I can't speak to it, a slow shift over to more optimistic fiction because it feels like we've gone so far so crazy that people want to escape it more as opposed to be forced to confront it. It's always that pendulum. And right now, I think we're moving toward the other side. And Big D is a character who would emphasize that aspect. And yes, I realize I'm talking about literature, but in terms of fiction, in terms of media, in terms of creation of stories, it all kind of fits in the same multi-setting, multi-platform I guess, multimedium genre. Written, viewed, heard, music can go from dark to happy to uplifting to depressing. It has options. And this is just the general meta swing. We're observing, right? Yeah, observing right now. For someone who is fully right aware now. of the horrible state of the world, but shows kindness and mercy in it, not due to being misguided or naive, but by being fully aware of it and making the conscious choice to act that way. Well, that decency is perhaps the weapon that will see him come out on top of all of this. Or at the very least, leave the world at large that one step closer to achieving the goals he himself falls short of. I've heard it said that a leader isn't someone who you follow just because they have a higher rank than you, or because you were told to follow them, or because you're just meant to. But someone whose actions you watch and whose words you listen to, and you realize that you believe in what they're doing and saying, and you want to see that vision come to life. A leader is someone who inspires you to choose to follow them. D is fascinating because he's such a walking contradiction. He's an optimistic but pragmatic, insane but highly intelligent, incredibly charismatic, and a hypocritical bad leader all rolled into one. But he is the kind of leader that makes people want to follow him. He makes me want to follow him. Within Alpha Abuser's community, this might be a controversial statement, but I'll stand by it. I don't think it's fair to call D an XB of Text to Speech's Emperor. I think D is his own character, with some similarities to be sure, but a completely unique character. I mean, I do fall more on the spiritual successor side because I don't think they're just copy and pasted. They just have a lot of elements that are very similar, intentionally so. But Big D always to me felt like he is what the Emperor could have been if the setting of 40k that Alpha Boosa, I can't speak today, Alpha Boosa was working with had more leeway or way further down the series line where things have progressed to the point where the emperor could get up he could act he could change things rather than just randomly just doing things at distance through power where he could physically get involved where we could see him walking around in a new body this is it feels like what the emperor could have transitioned into without all the steps being observed it, it, that's at least how it felt to me so still a spiritual successor, but more 
the vision of what Alpha Busa wanted to get to with the character, but wasn't able to. Maybe it would go this way, maybe it wouldn't. Maybe it was a dream that would never be in the show, but would be a fun thought experiment. That's what Big D feels like. It's a what if, the spiritual successor. And it's kind of how I felt about him in general. But I also would apply that to everyone. So he's still based on the Emperor heavily rather than a completely unique character. He's more so far advanced that he feels unique, but he has so much similarities. Again, spiritual successor is why I call him that. And this is part of why. And what I think is almost superior to the Emperor in nearly every way. Except in sarcastic dunks. On that yes. one, the Emperor batters the entire yeah, he is way funnier. Anyway, I've been rambling aimlessly for way too long, and considering how long it takes me to get anything done... We will reconvene in 84 years. Cheers, <laughs> Emps. So I'm just going to throw it out there. If you haven't already, go subscribe to Cosmic Void. That was a really good dive into the psychology of the character and how he's portrayed and how they equal up, but also giving you so much fundamental information about the various settings that inspired and shaped how that character could be interpreted to start with. And I love this. I love these deep dives into fiction. And the fact that someone's doing this with YouTube whole created content is freaking awesome. I thought I'd get into a part of this, maybe check it out later. I'm so fascinated with this. I did the entire damn video in one go, and I do not regret this. This is fascinating, and I'm going to probably just go binge his other videos because I can. Also, because I have no way I'm ever going to resist temptation to record a video reacting to it, because maybe I will, maybe I won't. But when I find something super fascinating, I often just binge it without realizing it. And I'm like, well, crap. It's happened more than once. There's a lot of videos that I've done or wanted to do and then didn't because I just watched them on my own time. It's a problem. I'm probably going to keep doing it anyways. Yeah. Otherwise, this... I thought this would scratch the itch for more Hunter the Parenting, and it did. Unfortunately, it then ripped open all those scars and it's like, hey, remember how you still want more? <laughs> you still want more. Meh. That said, I can go watch it, the old ones now and I'm going to go do that because binge watching, we. Yeah. You guys know the deal, though. Link below video. Hit it up. Subscribe to this guy. He did a great job. And I hope there's more coming out like this on various other settings. You need to check it out more. Again, hit it up. I'll see you in the next one. Adios.